on the altar, and it shall never go out. Hallelujah. If you would pray with me, Father, I thank you, Jesus. God, thank you for saving us. God, thank you for rescuing us. Lord, thank you for revealing who you are to us. And that you don't just stop at salvation. You continually reveal yourself over and over and over again. And you renew our faith and you're constantly there, Lord God. God, I pray that whatever state or condition we find ourselves in this morning, God, that you would breathe the fire of God into our spirit, Lord, that we would be encouraged this morning, Lord, that you would breathe upon the altar, Lord. God, touch us this morning. Reveal yourself to us this morning. Let us be open to hear what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to the church, oh God. God, you do what only you can do today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. When I began, when the Lord pressed the scripture upon my heart, I have to say, I was a little intimidated because I've never preached out of the book of Leviticus before. And that's like one of those books that nobody really runs to read and you kind of skip over it. But you know, there's some good analogies in this book to see Christ. See, Christ is from the beginning and he's all the way to the end from Genesis all the way to Revelations. You can see Jesus in every single book. And this book was written by Moses and it was written in the wilderness. And I love that because, you know, in the wilderness, in dry places, in hard places is where God can really begin to show up and God can really begin to show himself to us and reveal himself to us. So if you're in a hard place this morning or you find yourself going through a wilderness experience, ask God, reveal yourself to me, Lord, reveal yourself in this place that I'm at. Because Moses got a whole book out of being in the wilderness and God revealing the law to him and revealing himself to him. What was going on during the time of this book was written was the people were just brought out of bondage and they needed to learn how to live for God. And I found myself at one point saved for about five years and loving Jesus and being baptized in the Holy Spirit and I was healed of different things but I didn't know how to live for God in victory and in triumph and in constant grace so that's what we needed we need to learn today and that's what God was trying to reveal then he said it's all about you Jesus it's all about the sacrifice are we looking to the sacrifice? Are we, look, are we looking to other things? What are we looking for? So our heart and our, our eyes should constantly be fixed upon the sacrifice. Mm. This book was addressed to those that were in slavery and those that just came out of Egypt. And it was instructions to the Israelites saying, you have a mediator. You have one that stands in the gap for you. You have one that will answer you. You have one that has called you out of Egypt. And it teaches us how to approach God correctly. And there was a sacrificial system that they taught. It was also about holiness. Mm-hmm. See, we don't just get saved and live any way we want to live. God wants to save us. He wants to separate us. He wants to change us. He wants to change our hearts. He wants to change the way that we think. He wants to change the way that we perceive things, the way that we look at other people, the way that we handle relationships. He wants to change the way that we even perceive God. Because a lot of times we look at God the wrong way. He wants to change absolutely everything about you. And at the moment of salvation, he implanted everything you need. Yeah. 
Yes. Everything you need to live a godly life. Yes, did. And that fire was lit that day. But so many times, circumstances and situations and us not knowing how to approach God snuff out that fire. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God is about to light that flame again. Right. And if your flame is lit, he's about to light it even hotter and even higher. And I love that Pastor Matt began to pray about Mexico and said there's going to be a fire that sweeps across yes. Mexico. Well, I'm here to tell you that there's going to be a fire that's about to sweep across Patterson and sweep across the United States of America. And it starts with us. Yes. It starts with us positioning ourselves before the Lord. And he's going to work on us. Yeah. Yeah. He's going to work on the church first. Yeah. And he's going to light that flame across America. Yes. Hallelujah. So are you looking to the sacrifice? Mm -hmm. Is there a spirit of triumph? See, it's Palm Sunday. And Pastor Matt was like, I, he, said, he said he normally goes according to the days, but I don't have to go according to the days, whatever I feel led to be put on my heart. But <laughs> I began to think about this fire that should be shut up in our bones. And on Palm Sunday... When Jesus rode into town on that donkey and the people had been waiting for the Messiah. Right. The people had been waiting and looking and searching for a savior. Back in Zechariah, he prophesied that the savior would be riding upon a donkey. He said it back then. And all of the sudden, here comes the Messiah, and that which they had been longing for and seeking after was finally there. Have you ever prayed something before, and you've been praying for a really long time about it, and then all of a yes. sudden, yes. with your eyes, yes. you begin to see that thing oh, come yes. into formation. Yes. Yes. You begin to see your children come to Christ. You begin to see your marriage renewed. You begin to see your family come together. You begin to see your, the, that bondage that you had been broken. You begin to see yes. Christ revealed with your own eyes, personally encountering him in your life. Yeah. And that day those people seen that. And all they could say was Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And when you look it up in the Hebrew, when it meant it was a cry, it was a prayer. It said, save now. I beseech thee, save now. They had been waiting for the Savior and they were crying, laying their garments. I, and I just look at that like the old life. Like, I'm done with this. I need a Savior now. And they began to shout and praise him. Have you ever had God meet a prayer request and you are shouting and praising God, dancing in your car? Don't tell me you haven't because I know that you have. Been dancing and you've been shouting and somebody that doesn't know the Lord just looks at you and has no idea what's going on. But you know that God just revealed himself as faithful again. Yes. Amen. Well, I'm, and I was encouraged as I was reading this because they were saying, save now, I beseech thee, save me. And I was thinking how as believers, that still needs to be our cry. Right. Yeah. Every single day, yes. Yes. God, save now. Not that we have to be saved all over again or born again all over again, but we need God to save us. Save us from our own ignorance. Save us from our own flesh. Save us from the enemy. Save us from the world trying to pull at us at every turn. Save me now, oh God. Save me from this mindset. Save me from this pain that's been in my heart that I can't, I can't get it out on my own, Lord. Save my marriage. Save me now, Lord. Save me now. And I feel like that that should be the cry produced in every 
every believer's heart every day that we wake up. Renew it again, oh God. I've been waiting, Lord. I've been longing, Lord. I've been seeking you, Lord. God, renew me again, oh God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I love that when he was riding in, he knew that he was going to die. He knew that he was going to defeat hell and the grave. He knew he was about to break the back of sin. He knew that what dominated his people were no law was no longer going to dominate his people any longer. See, that should get you excited. We should be excited that God gave us the power to walk in victory and to walk. See, it was a triumphal entry. Yes, yes. We should walk in triumph daily as a child of God. And I'm not saying we're not going to struggle. And I'm not saying that we're not going to face some things. And God's not intimidated by our humanity. He knows that we're going to hurt and that we're going to cry. But can we be broken before him and still walk in triumph in our brokenness? And know what we have in him. When Jesus rose from the grave, it was God saying, I accept your sacrifice. I accept your sacrifice. It was confirming that what Jesus did was accepted, and now his people could have a new power source. His people could receive power that they never had. And that day, I believe there was a fire lit in their hearts. The same fire that should be burning in our hearts each and every day. Are we looking to the sacrifice? In the setting of Leviticus, and I just felt like that was relevant. That story was relevant for what I'm about to talk about. Because there was a fire that was shut up in the people's bones that day. And I feel like there should be a fire shut up in our bones today. And if it's not there, ask him for it. Ask him for it. Ask him to stir you. Ask him to touch you. Ask him to give you that fire for him first. And then it will go out to others. Your relationship with God will always reflect in your relationship with people. That's right. So in the beginning of this story in Leviticus 6, 6, 1, and you don't have to go there. I'm just going to explain a little bit to set the tone. God gives instructions to Moses to a soul that commits sin. Or to, and it's to their neighbor. See, God is a God of restoration. Yeah. He wants to restore. Yeah. Hallelujah. Believe that. Yeah. He wants to restore everything that has been broken down. Yeah. He wants to restore everything that has been stolen from you, from your family members, maybe from your job. He wants to restore all things, but he gives Moses instructions. And he says, restoration. He is the God of restoration and unity. Peace between God will bring peace between you. He wants unity within the body of Christ. That would be us. But he also wants you to have peace with those who aren't saved. Have you ever been in front of an unsaved person and you act out of character and they say something yeah. about it? I remember this one time. I will never forget it as long as I live. I was at work and I was always ministering to this one girl, Naira, who actually got saved and um, with Naya and I. And she goes, Angela. Are you going to let that snuff out your flame? And I was so convicted. Mm -hmm. Because how I was portraying my relationship with Christ, she asked me if I was going to let this circumstance snuff out my flame. (laughs) And I was so convicted. And I was like, Naira, forgive me. See, God wants us to even act right with the unsaved that they might see Jesus.
Jesus, that we might be a test. See, you might feel justified in the way that you would act or how you presented things, but if the Holy Spirit comes upon you and convicts you, you better go make it right. Yes. Yes. Make it right that they may see, see Jesus in yeah. you. That's good. That's yeah. good preaching. Paul said it's better that we make it right with our brother and sister than to, than to be right, basically. I'm paraphrasing. Just make it right. If they're offended, make it right. Now, standing up for righteousness is a whole different ballgame. You're going to make some people mad. But if you know that you are wrong, go make it right. Make it right with your brothers and sisters in here. Before you come in, in the household of God, or if you need to, in the household of God, make it right. Then there can be restoration yes, and then yes. the Spirit of God can move openly and can move freely in this place. And remember, when we sin against one another, you always are sinning against God first. Mm -hmm. See, in order to build a fire, he needs to deal with sin first. See, you're not going to go and lay uh, cinder blocks on a fire and it's not going to hinder it. Right. Mm -hmm. If God lit a fire in you and we know that we have done someone wrong or something wrong and we need to make it right and we don't, though that's going to cause a block between you and God and your brothers and your sisters. Yeah. So he wants to deal with sin first. So the Lord begins to give Moses instructions, and I liked this. First, we have to recognize. Second, we have to acknowledge. And in my mind, sometimes I'm like, well, that's the same thing. But I began to look it up, and I was like, wow, this is pretty good. Recognize means to identify that I'm wrong and to acknowledge that there is an existence that I'm wrong. So have you ever done something wrong and said, okay, that was wrong? But then acknowledge means to accept and admit the truth and confess it. Yeah, it's different. Yeah. Sometimes we can rec recognize and identify I'm wrong, but refuse to accept and admit it because that requ requires confession and humility. Yeah. yeah. So you can be wrong and you can never go make it right with God. You can never go make it right with a brother or sister. And that's not what God wants. God wants humility. He wants us to prefer one another. That's good, yeah. So you need to recognize and acknowledge that we're wrong. And I love the heart of King David because he was one that recognized, even though sometimes it takes us a little while to recognize <laughs> that we're wrong. But that's okay because, and that's why we should never judge one another. Because some of us take a little bit longer to learn some things than others do. And that's okay because we're in the process. Because that one thing you're dealing with, you're dealing with X and I is dealing with Y and I'm dealing with Z, but we're all dealing with something. Amen. So God is wanting to change things in each one of us to never look at the other with an evil eye because we're all in the process. But when the Holy Spirit does reveal it to you. Yeah. That's the time whether you are going to recognize and acknowledge. That's right. Recognize and acknowledge and confess it before him. And I love King David because the Psalms express his heart so much. It says in Psalm 51, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done evil in thy sight. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And what I love about King David's life, because it really sets us free in a lot of ways, is that King David was anointed to be king, given a position, but fell and messed up. But God didn't cast him away. He sent the prophet to tell him, you have done wrong in my sight. Recognize it, acknowledge it, confess it. And King David back then, there was Jesus wasn't there. It wasn't Jesus, but he knew to look to the sacrifice to come. Yes. He yes. knew to look to the sacrifice to come and say, create in me a clean heart, Lord. Yes. 
Renew a right spirit within me. That needs to be our cry today. Create, the, create in me a clean heart, oh God. And David's heart for the Lord encouraged me. But see, sin needs to be taken out. And that's why he said, create in me a clean heart. See, there are some areas in our life that need to be changed. And that need to be taken out. And need to be done away with. We need to let go of some things. We need to turn our back on some things. We need to keep going with Jesus. If the light of Christ has revealed something to you, light rejected is light removed. So if you're rejecting the Holy Spirit and what he is pressing his finger on, he will remove his light and allow us to go deeper and deeper and deeper until we decide to look up and say, Oh God, create in me a clean heart and renew your spirit within me. And I like this. Thank you for Toya and Troy. You know, I always have to have an object. All right, this is showing my age. Y'all remember the game operation? Okay. Well, I was thinking about how many times I played this game as a kid, and I was never good at it. Like, I always, and Case was in here, we were playing with it, and we were taking it out, and I always, always hit the side, like always, and the nose lights up, and it vibrates, and I could never get the bones out. And I was thinking about the Lord. How many times we've played the game? How many times we've tried to fix? And uh, little Carter was going down and saying, well, this is that, and this is that, and this is that. And there's many things in our life that Lord, the Lord wants to fix. Right. So he'll go from this to that, to this to that, and he won't do it all at once or we would be consumed mm -hmm. oh, yeah. by the work that he yeah. is doing. Yeah. So he does it a little bit at a time, but how many times do we try to fix it and get, okay, this, this vibrates, but get burnt mm -hmm. or get hurt? Or feel the pain. Yes. See, sin has consequences. Right. So when you touch the edge, the nose lights up red. So the Holy Spirit is saying, stop right there. Amen. That's a border you don't want to cross. That's a way you don't want to go. That's something that's going to cause you pain or harm or hurt you. Right, right. But by the grace of God... And we try to fix things and make a mess of things. And this guy's all messed up. <laughs> but the Lord, by his grace, will go in. And I don't even know if I can do it. But take things out so gracefully. Yeah. Yeah. He'll never touch the side. Right. The Holy Spirit, he'll fix everything. And, and it's his presence and it's the sweetness of his presence and, and it's spending time with him and allowing him. Yeah. But we need to position ourselves, lay it all down. So he's on his back. That's how bad he's been hurt. <laughs> and I know it's funny, but it's the truth. Because you ever felt like this? Yeah. This guy all busted up. He got wounds everywhere. But God will begin to restore. Amen. He'll begin to renew. Yeah. All we got to do is surrender. Yes. Right. All we have to do is surrender. So that was the heart of David. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. The reason why I'm telling you this is because in order for the fire to be lit and stay lit, God has to deal with our sin. God has to deal with our flesh. God has to deal with those bents that we have because we still have them. Young or old, we still have them. And God, want, no one is ever perfect. And we're not going to be perfect till we go to glory. Yes. And I can't wait to go to glory with you, but we're not going to be perfect until we go to glory. Yes. And then even in Psalms 139, he said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. David wanted to be in the presence of God and wanted him to show him him. So that God could reveal himself to him. Yeah. And that God could take out the old and put in the new. David's heart was to want the power and the presence of God. You want the fire? Get in the power and the presence of God. Enter into worship when we're worshiping. Worship in the car on Jess text me. And she said, <laughs> she texted me this song and it's called Hosanna. 
and Grace Brumley was singing it, and I, I just happened to be on the camera at Family Worship Center where I would look so funny, but my head was up like this, and but she screenshotted it, and she's like, is this you? <laughs> and I was like, actually, it is. I said, well, that's priceless, but... <laughs> Enter into worship, Al. She was worshiping at home. That was my point. Anytime you can enter into the presence, you can be on the job, entering in the presence of God. You can be at Walmart. You need the presence of God when you're in a Walmart line, right? Amen. You, when you're in Baton Rouge traffic, okay, when I'm driving through the water in my brand new car just to get to church here in the back road, yeah, I'm, I'm, I need to enter in into the presence. this uh, Saturday, actually. So, who, but who likes to test? But David is saying, I don't want to remain the same. Right, right. So test me and try me and see if there be any wicked way in me because I know you can change me. Oh, that's right. Hallelujah. And then I, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates. And reprobates means you're unapproved and you're rejected. Examine yourself. Am I in the faith? Am I believing God today? Am I trusting God today? Am I looking to him for provision today? Am I looking to him for healing today? Are you in the faith today? Are you playing operation in your own life? And I'm not preaching down. I'm preaching from experience, from what I'm going through. Are we trying to make things happen and fix things? Examine yourselves to see if we be in the faith. And what I liked about this is I was beginning to remember something that Pastor Borg taught on when we were in Hebrews class. When you get married, you wear a wedding ring. I'm not married, so I brought my ring pop. <laughs> Y'all remember these? Yeah. Right? So I was thinking about, can you put the, yeah, that's, that's a nice diamond right there, right? That's red. No. But when you get married, you wear a wedding ring to represent the covenant that you have made with your mate. When we give our hearts to Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ has made a covenant with us. Yeah. We are now in covenant with God. Yes. The blood represents the covenant that God made with his son and that his son made with us. Hallelujah. So now we are accepted into the kingdom of God and into the family of God. So we co he cut covenant with us. Yeah. So now we have a covenant. And the cross represents the covenant. So how, what, how many of you that are married, if you had your wedding ring on and all of a sudden it wasn't on your finger, would you notice that it was gone? That's something that you would notice. It's something that you would at, at least a little while look down and see that it's not there. <laughs> see, when you don't wear your wedding ring and you are married, you are exposed to things that like someone else coming and approaching you. Okay, so when we're not in the covenant and we're not in the faith, we are exposed right, to right. things creeping in our lives that we don't want in our lives or that will hinder our relationship with the Lord. So once we're cut covenant and gave our heart to the Lord, are we letting our wedding ring slip? Are we not looking to the covenant any longer? Have we taken it off and put it on the shelf for later? Mm, that's good. Have, we, have we forgot about it totally? Mm -hmm. <laughs> See, because God wants us to remember the covenant. 
And his covenant isn't a cheap 25 cent ring pot on your hand. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. The priceless blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 And I want to encourage you this morning because a lot of times we're like, man, I can't even obtain what she's saying. It's not about the quantity of your faith. It's about the quality. And you, the quality of faith is produced by looking at the right object. Yes. When you got saved, you just said Jesus. You just said Jesus. In the same way that you got saved is the same way that you say, stay saved. Same way that you got in is the same way that you stay in. That's it. And the quality, your quality should be anchored in Christ, the right object. Yes. Which yes. allows the spirit to do work in your heart. You should be spirit led, spirit, spirit filled. If you're not spirit filled, then we're going to get you spirit yes. filled. Yes. And you should be spirit controlled. Everything That's should good. be operating by the spirit of God. See, but that only comes by remembering the covenant. Yes. By looking yes. to the sacrifice. Yes. By remembering what he did for you. By yes. recalling to you. See, this is a relationship. You can't just sit back and expect everything to fall in your lap and everything. God wants relationship with his people. And as you are or coming to the covenant, he creates character. He creates quality. Nia and I were talking about this the other day. You can have all the fancy cars, all the fancy houses. Your body can look right and you can have all the fancy clothing and all the right words, but if you have no character, oh, if you don't have the operation of the Spirit of God in your life, you can have everything, but if you don't have character, quality being orchestrated in your heart and in your life, then there's nothing. There's nothing. God wants to create a people of quality, character, that others would see the anointing upon your life, but it takes us accessing the covenant, remembering the blood, and going to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Why do I say all this? Because God is dealing with sinful humanity to restore us in a spirit of triumph. We, you, you might not know why don't I have triumph today? Why don't I have that fire today? Examine thyself to see if you be in the faith. Let's look at our hearts and look, test me and try me. See if there be any wicked way in me, Lord. What's hindering this fire? What's hindering it me from growing? God wants to burn it all up. Anything that would hinder the fire. Because he wants pure fire. He's in the process of building a fire. Hallelujah, Jesus. And I don't know why, but in this story of restoration, right before my scripture, restoration means to bring back to a previous right. To reinstate, to return someone or something to a former place, position, or condition. To repair, to renovate, to rebuild, to reconstruct. I don't know what you have need of this morning. But God is in the repairing business. Yeah. He is in the reconstructing business. Yeah. Yeah. He is in the tearing down. And what he will tear down, he will always build back up. And what he does will be better and stronger than ever before. He will restore all the years that the canker worm has eaten. No matter what. I believe, and when I was in prayer, the Lord was impressing this on my heart. That somebody needs to hear this. Yes. That God is going to do something new in your life. You shall perceive it. You will see it. And you will know it. It's going to be better than anything you could have ever conjured up in your own strength. He's going to bring an increase to your life. He's going to bring an increase to this church, to the children's ministry, to the youth group. He's going to bring an increase. So buckle your seatbelts and get in. Yes, yes. Because he's going to do it. He's going.
he said, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That he will exalt you in due season. So are we. See, that's the recognize and acknowledge. Are we humbling ourselves and positioning ourselves to watch him move? Hallelujah. In Leviticus 6, 7, he begins to talk about, so he dealt with sin. He began to, to restore. And the priest makes an atonement for the sinner before the Lord. The priest makes the atonement. Mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is our high priest. Yes, yes. He is our high priest. And the priest was the one to make the atonement. What does atonement mean? To cancel or to cover? Mm -hmm. Love cover, covers a multitude of sin. Cancel as though it didn't happen. That's right. Your debt has been paid in full. My debt has been paid in full. I'm not just talking about the debt we owed the day that we got saved. There's some things that God's got to cover and he's got to cancel even this morning before you got to church. Before I got to church this morning. There's some things that he's got to cover and cancel that we thought about or did last night or had a perception of or whatever it might be. He's going to cover and it's paid in full. And I was thinking about the scripture as far as the east is from the west. Well, you can't bring the east and the west together. So your, your debt is covered. It is canceled. It is no longer there. Blotted out. Your sin is blotted out as though it never happened. It says Jesus is our high priest in Hebrews. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was at all points tempted like as we were, yet without sin. Jesus has gone before us. He's gone behind us. And he was tempted and he was touched, but he had no sin. Thank you, Lord. That, we, that he would pay the price for sin, that we would be restored daily Amen. to God. Amen. Daily to God. See, the priest went and said, every morning. Amazing. Every morning we got to go to the sacrifice. Every day we got to go to the sacrifice. Every moment that we're driving or walking or breathing, we have to be with our eyes fixed upon the sacrifice. Our hearts fixed upon the sacrifice. Continually meditating on the sacrifice. Meditating on what he did. There's a proper meditation to meditate on the word of God. To have it dwell richly in our hearts. Yeah. Hallelujah, Jesus. And then the chapter begins. And I thought this was very important. Because if we're looking to the sacrifice, well, what is the sacrifice? And there was a sacrificial system all through the Old Testament. And the offerings, there was a burnt offering. So find Jesus. Hmm. Listen for Jesus. The burnt offering meant to ascend and to go up to, in smoke. It was sweet aroma to the Lord. This was a complete destruction of an animal. Think about it. Complete destruction of a perfect animal. And it, except the hide. So except the remains. And why was this offering? To renew a relationship between man and a holy God. A sinful man and a holy God. The ultimate fulfillment of a burnt offering in the Old Testament was Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Amen. He was completely destroyed, except for the body that was laid in the grave. Hallelujah, Hallelujah Jesus. But then he rose from the grave, so there was no hide left. And he ascended to the Father and sat down at the right hand of the Father that meant that this was accepted and intoned for our sin. So what should we be looking at? The sacrifice. The grain offering. This grain offering had no bloodshed. It was a harvest of the land. He's harvesting our land. That's what God is doing here in Patterson, Louisiana. He's digging up the old and implanting the new and God wants to harvest the land. And how do you harvest the land with flour and oil and frankincense? 
See, the oil and the operation of the Spirit moving in this building will move outside of this building, and that will be a sweet-smelling aroma yes. to the town that's around us yeah. Yeah. and to those that we come in contact with. And it said that there was no leaven in the grain offering, so that there was no sin. But then there was grain and there was salt, and that represented covenant with God. What was this offering for? It was a recognition of God's blessing. <clears throat> Do you count your blessings? Mm -hmm. Do we count our blessings? Do we look to what God has already done and know he is able to do above and beyond that? This was an outward expression of an inward devotion. Yeah. Let me say that again. An mm -hmm. outward expression of an inward devotion. The, it, the grain offering was something that recognized God's blessing upon our lives. And it was an outward expression Ultimately, God, ex Jesus expressed his devotion to God by dying on the cross as an offering, as a sacrifice for our sin. I am devoted to you, Father, no matter what the cost, and I'm going to offer and lay down my body to be broken for you. That's what we should be like. that says thanks be to God that always causes us to triumph yeah. thanks be to God yeah. because that sprinkling of the blood upon the altar thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere I'd rather dwell in the household of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked Amen. Thank you, Lord. bless the Lord all my soul and forget not his benefits See, when we begin to remember the benefits of even the sacrifice that was shown in the Old Testament, we're talking about renewal with a holy God, restoration between one another. We're talking about an inward devotion expressed outwardly and a thanksgiving. Does our life express that we are thankful for what Jesus did for us? There should be a thankfulness in our heart. And the last offering that they spoke about in this chapter was for purification and change. The sin offering. Designed to deal with unintentional sin. Well, thank God for that. Because I know for a fact that I have unintentionally done harm at times. And I need someone, his name is Jesus, to cover me. To cover me. Hallelujah. And the one who committed the sin placed the hands on the animal and slaughtered it. And I think time and time again, they just keep saying slaughtered it and demolished it. And, and I'm like, man, but it represented what that did to Jesus on Calvary. Amen. And you transfer sin to the animal and the blood was sprinkled. Listen to this. Seven times before the veil of the sanctuary, giving you access to the presence of God. See, God gave us access to his presence when Jesus Christ died on the cross and tore the veil. Awesome. That we would have constant access. See, when I began to read the book of Leviticus, and I'm like, really, Lord? But it's Jesus. <laughs> it's just Jesus. And I know this is a lot of information to kind of swallow up at one time, but it was so good that it's just Jesus. Hallelujah. It's just Jesus. And he did it all. And he paid it all. And he's here to be the priest and to make mediation for you unintentionally, intentionally, stubbornly, self-willed, prideful, whatever. God created me a clean heart. Restore me back to you. Light that fire up and light the fire in me again. And I love this. And John it said that no man take it, his life from me. But I lay it down myself. 
I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. This commandment have I received from my Father. See, Jesus didn't go to the cross begrudgingly. And I know sometimes we, we have to drag ourselves to that place. He has to drag us there. But Jesus chose, right? Jesus chose. He had a choice. Even as the Son of God, He had choice. He had a latitude to do and choose. And He chose to go to the cross. He desired to do the will of God. He said, nevertheless, not, I don't know how many, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I've been in, but it's been a lot. Amen. And I know for each one of us, it's been a lot. But that's the olive press. Yes. That's the pressing where God's just creating oil and a fragrance and an aroma yeah. that it's eternal. Hmm. What God is doing in our hearts and in our lives and in this church is an eternal work. A work of quality. A work that no one else can do but only Him. And then in Leviticus 6.10 it says that they laid a garment upon Him. He took off His garment and He laid the priestly garment upon Him. See, it's no longer us, but it's all Him. It's no longer our life, but it's his life. A new power source, eventually a new body in glory. Hallelujah. 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 And then in verse 12, it says, The fire upon the altar shall be burning in it and shall not be put out. Accessing Jesus through faith and grace will continually produce A moving of his spirit. Yeah, that's good. Continually walking and treading upon faith and grace. Continual grace, continual power, continual change, continual fire. That's how that will go. He will deal with us, he will restore us, he will renew us, and he will create that fire to continually burn. Continual grace. Continual power, continual change, and continual fire. It's a constant progression of change and growth that he wants to create in our lives. And when you go back home and you're around friends or family or those that you don't know, that fire will catch hold in your school or catch hold at your job because you're continually accessing the power of God, the presence of God. You're looking to the sacrifice and allowing him to do what only he can do in your life and don't quit the road's gonna get tough the road will get hard and I if you would come up but Isaiah was being contorted literally contorted in his body and I don't know if anybody know what pain like that is if you ever broke a bone or anything but literally Isaiah was being contorted with his body because of preaching the gospel and he felt like he couldn't go on any longer And I don't know if you've ever been through a painful situation that has been so bad, so bad in your life that you feel contorted, even in your faith. But Isaiah, he went to God and he said, I don't know if I can preach anymore. But there was a fire that was shut up in his bones that would not be put out, that the Holy Spirit would not allow him to be quiet. See, and that's what happens when we access the sacrifice. It said every morning to lay the sacrifice on the altar every day. Lay your burdens down. And if you would stand with me every day, lay your cares down every day. Look to the sacrifice and allow him to do what he wants to do. Leviticus 6.13 says, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. You can not exhaust the power and presence of God. You cannot exhaust the freedom He provides. You cannot exhaust the healing that He provides. You cannot exhaust the love of God that He provides. You can't exhaust Him. And this is one lie that the enemy sows in my heart and 
someone said this, and I will never forget it, that it is God's will that you be free. Well, why can you say that, Angela? Because he was nailed to the cross for you. It's his will that you be free. He died and was nailed to the cross that you would be free. Therefore, it is his will that you be free. It is his will that you be healed. Why can you say that? Because he took the stripes upon his back. So therefore, it is his will that you be healed. In your mind, it is his will that you have peace of mind. Yes. That you have peace in your heart. It is his will. Why can you say that? Because he willingly wore the crown of thorns. It is his will. It is his will that you walk in triumph and have that fire. Why can you say that? Because he died to give it to you. 